Hello? I wish we could have all been together in person for the workshop, but I'd like to start off by acknowledging the great job that Ushman Dani and Nick Ann did in organizing it under very challenging circumstances. The focus of my talk is on intermittent image feedback. Um, given the time constraints, my presentation is rather a shallow overview of the motivation, challenges, opportunities, and a quick review of some of our contributions focused on intermittent image feedback. But I provide a link at the end of the presentation for a deep dive into the specific mathematics. First, to motivate the intermittent image feedback problem, we consider this video where we're attempting to perform feature point tracking, which is the blue and the green dots that you see in the image. And so based on how these feature points move in time and space, we have to do things like structure or motion estimation. But there are uncontrolled environmental effects. As you can see, the parking sign comes and erases some of the feature points, and then subsequently the utility pole uh, moves across the screen and erases the feature points as it does that, and this potentially destabilizes the image-based observers. Losing feature points isn't always a bad thing, provided we can control the amount of time that the features are not in the field of view. So here, rather than create odd trajectories required for the non-holonomic vehicle to follow in order to move around the object while keeping it in the field of view, we purposefully allow the target to leave for an improved trajectory, although the trajectory design is done in a way that accounts for how often we need to see the target so that we don't get lost. In this video, a uh, quadcopter is trying to use its aerodynamic forces to herd each of these unactuated paper plates to a goal location. But in doing so, a strategy has been designed to purposefully switch between each target in order to effectively corral each of them to the goal location, which as shown in the video causes some of the targets to intermittently leave the field of view. And in this final video, a quadcopter is trying to track two mobile robots along an unknown virtual road network shown in the cartoon in the upper right hand side. However, the field of view of the camera is restricted so the quadcopter can't see both vehicles at the same time. So in this application, we followed one mobile robot around until we learned the road network. And then we developed an algorithm to switch between each robot so that we could maintain a virtual persistent viewing. This is obviously also requires the robots to continuously go in and out of the field of view as shown in the bottom left video. So for each of these previous videos, we are performing image-based estimation or visual server control with feedback that's intermittent. So we need a set of tools to ensure these intermittencies don't have destabilizing effects. We model these problems as switched or hybrid systems. In general, hybrid systems are composed of subsystems that have continuous dynamics with discrete switching. The switching can be due to communication events, decision logic, or in our case, intermittency due to the target leaving the field of view. Hybrid systems theory provides a framework to determine performance certificates and potentially provides scalability bounds on the network. And these are done through the development of timing conditions that ensure stability. So the image on the bottom left corner shows a Lyapunov function converging as indicated by the green curve. And this green curve corresponds to the time when the target's visible and providing feedback to some predictor or estimator. But when the target leaves the field of view and no feedback is available, then our estimate of its location degrades, as indicated by the red lines, which show divergence. But by managing the amount of time that the object is in the field of view, based on the convergence and divergence rates, then we can ensure overall stability and even potentially convergence, at least up to some residual error. And these timing conditions are called dwell time conditions. 
To develop image-based estimators and predictors, it's first important to understand exactly what we're measuring from the image. First, in the image space, we measure the pixel coordinate, typically given by U or V of some feature. Next, by using a pinhole camera model, we can relate the pixel coordinates to a Euclidean coordinate system. For example, here a unit vector from the camera to the feature can be determined, and the camera coordinate system can be related to any Euclidean reference frame. However, the challenge here is that the image is two-dimensional and the Euclidean space is three-dimensional, and obviously the missing dimension is the distance to the target. Image-based estimators and predictors are complicated by the fact that this unmeasurable state appears nonlinearly in the image dynamic. To determine the Euclidean motion of a target, we often track the velocity of the target in the image coordinates, which is also called the optic flow. <clears throat> Using multiple views of the target, we can determine the structure, which means the Euclidean coordinates of the image features, and the motion of the target, which is the time varying trajectory of the feature. Multiple views can be from multiple physical cameras, for example, a stereo pair, or from a single camera that's just looking at multiple views that and then it relates the position and orientation of the target through these multiple snapshots and that's typically back to the original view which is also sometimes called the keyframe. So from the image we're typically measuring the position and orientation trajectory of a set of features that can be related through the image kinematics. When we can't see the features Sometimes we can exploit a motion model, and sometimes this is known or assumed, or sometimes it's a model that we have to learn through adaptation to facilitate the development of motion predictors. Instead of using a motion model, one can imagine doing a variety of things when the target's not visible. For example, one could use a simple zero-order hold. We've in fact shown the theoretical bounds for a zero-order hold, and have shown in experiments that for some frequency of intermittency that it works. However, a motion model-based prediction method can extend the amount of time that the target can be occluded, thus improving robustness of the approach. In this simulation, we use the same intermittency profile denoted by the vertical lines in the upper left-hand corner and on the individual plots, which denotes switching instances when the target becomes visible or becomes occluded. Using this switching profile, the estimator with prediction converges, meaning that the red line representing when a predictor is used because the target is occluded, and the green line denoting when the image feedback is available, overlap with the blue ground truth perfectly for the prediction method on the right, versus the plot on the left hand side that doesn't show convergence, where the straight horizontal red lines represent the periods during the zero order hold, and the green lines represent image feedback. From this plot, you can see that during the periods when image feedback is visible, the green traces try to converge, but are disrupted sufficiently fast that the estimates never converge. This video shows an example experiment using a motion predictor. Here, the goal is to learn the position and orientation of the target with respect to the camera, where the camera is either stationary like it is now or moving as it will be subsequently. As illustrated in the video, there is arbitrary and uncontrolled image intermittency. The role of the predictor decreases the growth rate of the estimate divergence or instability sufficiently, thereby increasing the dwell time to maintain stability. Here the predictor is using reported velocity information from the collaborative vehicle, and for the case of the moving camera, the motion of the camera is also assumed to be known. As I mentioned earlier, 
Often the goal is to observe the motion of features as they move in space and time and then relate them back to the keyframe or the initial frame as shown in this video where the keyframe is the image on the left. There are several reasons that motivate this approach, one being that the keyframe is static and thus the plethora of adaptive control methods that have been designed to compensate for unknown constants are applicable here to help learn the structure about the scene and then this can be related to features in the current frame. Traditionally, one of the assumptions in image-based estimation methods is called the positive depth constraint. Specifically in, in typical methods where the object is assumed to remain in the camera field of view, it's a pretty mild assumption that along the axis directed out of the camera lens that the coordinate along this axis remains positive. However, if we allow the target to leave the field of view, then this constraint becomes very restrictive. To address this issue, we reformulate the positive depth constraint as an assumption that the distance from the coordinate frame attached to the camera to the target remains positive. And although this video shows that right here, the typical depth constraint uh, assumption would have causal singularity, um, here, that's not going to cause a singularity unless the camera actually collides with the target. So in this video, we're using the problem formulation, this new problem formulation, along with a new adaptive control method called integral concurrent learning to identify the structure in the scene. And then from this identified structure, that's the distance from the coordinate system of the keyframe image to the target in the keyframe, then I can use this relative motion information to determine the camera pose even as you see there when the camera when the target is out of the field of view. And here are the experimental results from the previous video where the orange line is the estimate of the camera's position in the plane versus the blue ground truth. And we can extend this to observing moving targets as well as seeing these plots where just to make things fun, the color scheme here is switched where the blue trace is the estimate of the orange ground truth. We can also extend these ideas to networks of cameras. For example, consider the case of an urban surveillance system where there may be many cameras that are distributed in an area of interest that may or may not have overlapping fields of view. We can again apply the same estimation prediction ideas where information is shared among the different cameras and agents in the system. But questions arise related to how long can feedback be unavailable to reliably track a target and if we have the choice to design the camera structure, can the dwell time information be used to inform the network design? to minimize, for example, the number of static cameras that would be needed in order to provide a continuous stable estimate of targets that are likely going to be moving in the camera's field of view. To give a little more insight into the design process and the challenges, consider a mobile agent moving in a camera's field of view. Maybe there's a time when the camera has collected enough images to learn something about the target for example, the motion model parameters or the structure. Using, for example, this finite time learning method I mentioned earlier, integral concurrent learning. While the target's visible, we can show convergence of, for example, a Lyapunov function that's plotted below for clarity, and hence the estimation error. If the finite learning condition is satisfied, which we denote here to occur at a time capital TN, then we can conclude faster convergence, in fact we can conclude exponential convergence of the estimators. But without sufficient learning, maybe we can only converge to a residual error asymptotically the size of beta 1. But if the learning conditions are met, then we can converge faster exponentially to a smaller bound such as CUB. However, when feedback's not available, as mentioned in previous slides, the estimates can grow as shown by the red curve representing the divergence of the Lyapunov function or the dead reckoning error growth of the predictor estimator. This cycle of feedback and then no feedback can be combined as shown here 
where we'd like to control the timing and convergence rates so that the errors converge to small enough, fast enough, over a long enough period of time that the divergence is slow enough over a short enough period of time that the system remains stable. And by that I mean that the peaks of the Lyapunov function at the different time instances continue to decrease overall or have a decreasing trend. We can even set a desired tolerance based on emission objectives. Here the maximum tolerable error growth outside the feedback region for example, that we could tolerate before the agent gets lost, is noted by B upper bar. Then we can use hybrid systems methods to determine the maximum dwell time, or how long you can dwell outside of the feedback region before, for example, the agent gets lost, required to meet that specification. Here, the maximum dwell time is determined as the inverse of the gross growth rate multiplied by the natural log of the maximum tolerable error divided by the minimum error we need before the target leaves the field of view again. And likewise, there's a minimum dwell time condition, or the minimum amount of time that we need to remain within the field of view, denoted by delta t on, that we can use to enforce the need for the Lyapunov function to decrease to a value small enough, specifically to be under bar, before leaving the field of view. The minimum here is the negative of the inverse of the decay rate times the natural log of the minimum tolerance minus the residual error bound divided by the maximum error tolerance, and these are all known constants. In fact, using these known constants along with a calibrated camera and some assumptions on the maximum rates of the target, one can predict the target's motion and determine where the next cameras need to be placed in order to satisfy the dwell time conditions, basically to ensure that the target won't get lost before it gets picked up by the next camera in the network. In our most recent result, under review at the CDC, we extend this idea to multiple regions in a network where cameras could be moving within each different region. Essentially, each camera patrols an area and tracks a target within the area until it's handed off, maybe after some potential time without being seen by any camera, to another patro camera patrolling an adjacent region. Specifically, we design controllers to coordinate the camera agents and then estimators predictors for tracking the target through the um, intermittent visibility regions. To give a high-level perspective of the hybrid systems analysis involved, let's start with a target being viewed by a moving camera, similar to the video used to explain the predictor versus the zero-order hold, if you recall. And so the estimators are converging because the moving camera is watching the uh, moving target, but uh, and perhaps even exponentially so, as the red and green curves would indicate if sufficient learning is achieved. <clears throat> then perhaps the camera can move outside of its feedback region to maintain a view of the target, but maybe this region is a GPS denied region where it no longer has feedback. So even though the camera can still see the target, its own estimate of its own position is diverging maybe at a slower rate than the estimate would have been for the target if the camera hadn't sta had stayed in the feedback region. So therefore our estimation of the target's position is diverging. Then the camera, maybe it reaches some maximum dwell time condition and it has to leave the target and return to the feedback region. And this just leaves the target to move without any feedback or being viewed by any camera. And so the divergence right here can potentially grow even faster. And then we can assume that a camera from the neighboring region leaves its feedback region to intercept, that is to view the incoming target. And so again, now we're seeing the target again by the moving camera in the next feedback region, but because its own estimate of itself is becoming corrupt because it's in a GPS denied region, for example, then, you know, maybe the estimate is still diverging. Uh, again, maybe at a slower rate though. And then finally, the camera returns to the feedback region so it has a good estimate of its own location. It can see the target, and so it can estimate the relative position of the target. And so now the estimation and prediction errors can again um, converge. 
and potentially exponentially fast provided the sufficient learning is happening. And as seen in the figure, this process needs to satisfy the minimum and maximum dwell time conditions at these different transition points so that ultimately the peak of the Lyapunov function each time it enters a new image feedback region is less than or equal to the previous time it entered a feedback region. You can even imagine within these feedback blocks, this OJ for example, that um, the camera could be experiencing intermittent viewing of the target. So for example, if you recall the video of the quadcopter trying to track multiple vehicles following that virtual road network where it had to switch between the two different um, vehicles to keep a, a running estimate of where those targets are. So in conclusion, there's significant challenges to understand when considering intermittency, especially when coupled with learning and adaptation. As I mentioned earlier, my goal was to provide a high-level perspective of the motivations, challenges, and future efforts for intermittent image feedback. For a more in-depth review of these works mentioned here and many others, please visit the link at the top of the page. Also, for many of our laboratory videos, you can check out our Nonlinear Controls and Robotics YouTube channel. I'd like to end the presentation by acknowledging several classes of former graduate students that have helped with the development of this work, including in particular much of the recent work by Dr. Zach Bell, Mr. Chris Harris, and Dr. Anup Parikh. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the generous support from the Air Force Research Laboratory and AFOSR.